just started reading some stuff online about it that caught my attention. I saw some people that were... You teach people how to do this themselves so they can do it themselves. You, like I said, you can turn a lot of those so-called negatives into positives. Welcome everybody to the show. This show is created to help businesses start or grow their real estate investing businesses by bringing you guests. They can share their journey with you so you can learn from not only their successes, but more importantly, possibly their failures. So I want to encourage everyone to realize there's unlimited, unlimited potential and that you can get there faster by working smarter. So hopefully this conversation will prove it to you today and help you work smarter. Remember, uh, when you want to get somewhere and get something done, don't ask, how can I do it? But more importantly, who can get me there? So I'm Tony Javier. 20 year real estate investor, and most importantly, known as the TV guy. So, if you guys want to dominate your market with TV commercials, go to 10xTV.co. Again, that's 10xTV.co. We're actually partnering with people in other TV markets. So, I'd love to talk to you about that. So, I'm excited, uh, super excited today about our guest, Pete Reese. We're going to talk about land, which is a great topic of conversation and something I've been talking about in some of my mastermind groups. So, Pete, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Tony. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We just realized we're probably, what, five or 10 minutes away from each other. Yeah, uh, yeah, we're neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> Which is super cool. We'll so do it non-virtual next time, maybe. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Next time we'll have you in person. So, <laughs> well, awesome. So land, not a lot of people think about land when it comes to real estate investing. So just curious on how you got started with land and, and kind of what got you thinking about land. And it seems like a much easier way to flip property as opposed to houses. So uh, tell us I'm your story. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of stumbled into this business model a couple years ago, just reading some stuff online. I was, I've was i been a real estate broker since 2006. I'd started investing in you know, 2002, right around there. So I've, I've been in the real estate game for quite some time and then kind of took a break from it in maybe 2015, 2000. 20, somewhere around there. And I was like, I, I got to get back in the game, you know, real estate investing. I've always loved it. It's kind of who I am, who I consider myself to be. So I just started reading some stuff online about it that caught my attention. I saw some people that were, you know, talking about deals they were doing where they were, you know, buying properties for 10,000, selling them for 30,000, and kind of the business model that they were using to, to get these deals and make the system work. And it just really kind of intrigued me. I thought, hey, that's, that's pretty cool. You know, I'd like to triple my money on every deal. And I could see how scaling that up could be pretty easy. Maybe not easy, but doable. And yeah, I bought a training course on it and just dove in, learned everything I could about land. I, you know, I had a good basic understanding of, of land and how to develop and, and those type of things. But the business model itself, you know, how specifically to make the machine work. And then I just started diving in. I sent out my first batch of 10,000 pieces of mail, I think almost two years ago. I think it was December of 2020 when I sent out those first 10,000 letters and I did my first deal in land flipping in March of 2021. And this year, uh, 2022, I'm on track to do about 4 million in revenue at about a 50% gross profit margin. So on average, we're pretty much doubling our money. That's amazing. So, my ears perk yeah. up when I hear those numbers, man, because you yeah, know, yeah. You, <laughs> in order to, 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 to do that many houses, man, that's, that's a lot of transactions and a lot of, yes. as, as you said, before we started tenants and toilets and, you know, things of that yeah. nature. So, so, so walk us through a transaction because I think most people know how a real estate transaction works with, with houses, right? You know, mm -hmm. either you wholesale a house, which you're getting a contract on a house and then you're finding a back end buyer, or if you're flipping a house, you're actually doing work on the properties and whatnot. And it sounds like you're closing on all of these deals, right? Mm -hmm. So walk, walk yep. us through a typical transaction, how the closing works. Do you do any improvements to it? Do you split the lots up? Like, you know, tell us, tell us how that, all that works. Sure. Well, here's the basics of the business model, at least the way I do it. There are a number of different ways to, to skin the cat, as they would say. Um, there's a lot of different models associated with the land investing business, but here's what I do. I It starts with direct mail. All of our business is generated with direct mail. We send out letters to people, to to property owners directly. You know, we use information that we compile. We compile lists from a company called uh, Data Tree. It's the first American company. Mm -hmm. So we prepare lists, send them out. And, and basically, I'm sending out things all over the country. I'm not, I'm not really doing any deals in my own backyard here. Mm -hmm. And so we send out, you know, stuff to, to get the phone ringing or emails coming in or mail coming back. And these are actual offers that we're sending to people. And it's based off of kind of averages say, you know, like, uh, in a certain area, a property might sell for $3,000 an acre. We might offer them you know, a thousand or 1500 an acre. And, you know, they'll call back or respond back in some way and either say they're interested or, or we're too low or 
or they're interested, but then we look at it and we're not interested because of, you know, it's a swamp land or it's landlocked or something. So <laughs> we go through that process. We come together on a deal with the property owner, and then we um, move forward with our due diligence. So we have a whole kind of uh, process that takes place once we get under contract. Um, we send a photographer out to the property, normally a drone photographer as well walk the property. We also work with uh, local agents that will give us their opinion on the property about the area and what they think that they could resell the property for. Uh, we do all the transactions through an escrow or title attorney's office. So we do every, make sure the title's good before we close. And then we buy it. 99% of the cases, we're buying them just for cash. And then we close on the deal. And then we immediately list it for sale. And we list it at a price that's slightly below market in most cases, so we can generate a, a quick resale. And our average days in our inventory is 60 days, and that's including you know the resale escrow period. So, and and uh, as far as improvements on the properties, we do uh, improvements sometimes. It's kind of dependent on the property itself. Sometimes we'll do some some basic clearing so people can access the property and and kind of walk it. Sometimes we'll do a perk test. Sometimes we'll order a survey. And uh, we've done properties where we'll split them up. You know, we'll take a and we just did one seventy five acre property and we split it up into five parcels. It's a minor minor subdivision, which in a lot of states is pretty easy. Basically, you just hire a surveyor. They they go out and do it and then they file it with the county and then you've got five for one and then we resell them individually and just by doing something like that you can create value but awesome. there's yeah in a lot of cases it's really not that extensive what we do to the properties it's mainly about buying a property right and then being able to market it right as well have you any properties you bought where you did the due diligence you closed on it and then you're like crap i can't sell this for some reason that would be my concern just not knowing a lot about land you know, whether it's uh, potentially in a floodplain or maybe there's some kind of restrictions. I mean, I'm sure you do do your due diligence to make sure some of those things don't happen, but has it ever happened to you? We've had some properties that haven't been great, some deals that haven't worked out great. I haven't lost money on any deal yet, knock on wood, and I've got nothing in our inventory, which I anticipate losing money on. So we're pretty, we, we have a pretty thorough process as far as our due diligence goes at this point. Uh, we use a lot of online tools where we could tell a lot of that stuff before we even get under contract with the property. You know, say it's uh, in the FEMA flood zone or if it's uh, wetlands or if it's landlocked and and a lot of different a lot of different things that we look at. And, you know, there are some that I, you know, in hindsight, I wish I didn't buy, mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, you're always going to have those type of deals. And then I have some that worked out way better than I thought they would as well. So they mm -hmm. kind of make up for those, those yeah. kind of dogs. <laughs> and the great thing is, I mean, tell me about the price points. Like what is your typical mm -hmm. price point that you buy, you buy land in? Yeah. I, I mean, it started out, you know, when we, we first started, I was, I, I would buy pretty much anything, you know, in the five to $50,000 price range. And then it, my goal was to kind of double our money on each deal. And then, you know, as we got going further, I realized, hey, you know, some of these, some of these cheap properties, they have a great return. So I might buy something for five and be able to net 15. So you triple your money, but it's not really going to move the needle, needle that much as far as the mm -hmm. business as a whole. So I've, this last year, I've really started kind of backing away from those deals because, you know, like, like with anything else, some of the, the smaller deals, they sound really appealing. They sound great, but they take actually more effort than the bigger deals. Mm -hmm. and um, cause more problems sometimes. <laughs> right. mean, they're, they're junkier properties, I guess. It's, it's a good way to so, put it. So you're saying 50000 and above now is kind of what you're trying to deal with for the most yeah, part? Yeah, that's that's a good benchmark, you know, and the highest I've done so far is I bought one for three fifteen, sold it for five ninety five. dollars So that wasn't quite a double, but still a substantial amount of money. And, you know, and I've got a couple that were in escrow to buy that are that are larger than that, three sixty five dollars and four. 75 somewhere in there but in both of those i anticipate being able to double our money so awesome it just kind of being able to like continually keep the money moving and trading up man you're getting me excited about land <laughs> it's i, I don't it. know i'm a big fan i mean and i'm not i've never considered myself to be a land person any of those types of things i mean i've always been into houses like like most other people and i've flipped houses and in, in my past quite a bit. And I don't know, it's just a, it's just a kind of an easier business model. It's kind of the blue ocean, as they say, you know, flipping mm -hmm. homes is kind of the red ocean right now. There's so many people doing it. It's yeah. tough. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Absolutely. No, I love it. Um, as I told you before we, you know, push play here, I've got uh, clients we run TV with around the country and they're getting some land, land deals and they're making six figures on them. 
you know, and it's yeah. hard, it's hard to make six figures on a house, especially when your average price point like mine is 150, 200,000. And so like my ears perked up and I'm like, well, wait a second, you know, how, how can we, you know, do this with, with other people? So we're actually launching, launching TV commercials for those that just want to find land. And I feel like, like you said, it's a blue ocean where not many people are thinking about it. In fact, we had a call today, a mastermind call for, for our TV clients and one of the guys that were launching is launching land. And another guy was like, wait a second, you can really make money on these deals. So I connected them and he's like, we had a great conversation. There's a deal that I might be able to make work that I normally would have just thrown to the side. And I bet you a lot of real estate investors do that where they get a land deal and they're like, I can't do anything with this because they don't think a house is on it. Right. And it's yeah, the same, and you know, yeah, like, go ahead. I was just gonna say, it's the same thing with sellers. You know, I'm sure that's probably why it's profitable is not many people are marketing for land. And then when you, when they get a postcard from you, they're like, Oh, wait a second. Um, I am sick of paying that tax bill. And yeah, this out, this land isn't making me any money. I'll just, you know, I'll just sell it. And they sell it for, you know, half or a third or a fourth of what, what the property is really worth. Yeah. And you know, I was always under this impression in the past that land takes forever to sell. You know, that was my kind of big hang up. Like, okay, it's great. You might be able to make it some good money on land doing a development or, or something like that, but it's going to take forever to sell. And this business model kind of is the opposite of that. I mean, like with 60 day average hold time on our inventory, we're selling things very quickly. And, you know, w when you kind of do the math and, and you really start calculating your, your return on investment, uh, especially if you multiply that out for, for an entire year, it's kind of staggering numbers. And it's, you know, the whole key is buying right and then being able to resell right. The other thing that I think is really important is to kind of know the area that you're dealing with. Some areas, there's a lot of activity. Like there's a lot of land transactions, purchases, there's a lot of listings, there's a lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Some areas, there seems to be somewhat of an imbalance between what the sellers are expecting and uh, what the buyers want to pay for them. So not a lot of, not as many transactions happen, like not a lot of deals happen, but if you look for the markets where there's an, there's an active market, you know, like there's a pretty solid understanding of like, okay, land in this area goes for 3000 an acre. And when that's well-defined, there happens to be a, a lot more activity. Where do you find those comps? Um, you know, people in the, go through the MLS to find, you know, comps mm -hmm. for houses. Do you use like LoopNet or, or where do you find your comps for? Yeah. Most of the land? comps, most of the comps that we do are on Zillow. Really? So you can, you can fill, you can search for land on there as well. And then mm -hmm. just filter it by, by the, you know, by the um, acreage ranges and how long, you know, when it's old and you know or how long it's been on the market then we also use a place like uh land watch is another big kind of portal for land only listings but they you can't look up sales on there that's the only problem but you can get and get, get an idea for what competitive listings are like and if there's a lot kind of going on in those areas Mm -hmm. The other great thing about land, I'm sure, is is the price point. So if you do want to deal under fifty thousand, either one, some people have the cash to pay for that, or two, you don't have to tie as much private money up, right? And if you're turning them in sixty days, that's not that's not that much time to to have no. to hold, hold the property. So I like yeah, that. Yeah, I'd say that's too. that's that's one restraint if you're looking to do it, you know, by yourself. It's hard to find lenders. It's hard. There's no real hard money lenders for land. I mean, they're they're probably out there, but they're not not readily available, uh, I guess you could say, but there are people that will partner with you. There's a, there's kind of an active market for that. So what the typical deal is, is they will put up all the funds. You know, you bring the deal, say, say I, I got a property under contract for 50,000, the thing's worth a hundred. And I can demonstrate that as, as an actual real deal. And they'll put up the 50,000, close the deal. And then when it sells, you guys split the profits. I'd be in on those deals 100%. Yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> that's actually a win-win for both sides because, you know, the investor, it's like an infinite ROI because they're not putting any of their money up, only the money to acquire the deal itself. So direct direct mail or whatever else mm -hmm. is involved with that. Mm -hmm. And then the, the funder side, I mean, they're getting unbelievable returns, you know, on their money for not doing anything. Mm -hmm. So there's yeah. risk, but, you know, if, if you know what you're doing, the, the risk can be kind of minimal. So yeah. as long as you're buying the properties right, you know, the downside risk is is really pretty minimal. If you're buying properties right and if you're buying decent properties at the, at a good price in an area where things sell, you're it's going to be hard to go wrong. It's going to be hard to lose, really. What are your thoughts on uh, texting or cold calling those leads as well? Is direct mail just a lot easier where it's inbound and it's just, you know, you're dealing with more motivated sellers as opposed to having to, to go through a bunch of, bunch of crap? 
leads, you know, mm-hmm. like you do a text and cold calling. Is that kind of why direct mail you think works so well? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the business model that I started with and we've just kept at it. I've thought about getting into texting or cold calling, but just haven't done it. What's, what's interesting is that we can, we can pretty much target the kind of properties that we want with the direct mail. And I guess we could do that by, you know, creating that list and skip tracing it and then, and then doing, doing it that way as well. But I do think that I do like it because the inbound leads, you know, they're uh, they're a lot more motivated. And our cost per deal in last year for the whole year, our cost per deal was about twenty five hundred dollars per. That was going to be one got... of my next. That was going to be one of my next okay. questions. Your cost per yeah. deal. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, it's crept up a little bit this year. That's because we're going after bigger properties. So you know, it's probably three thousand thirty two hundred somewhere in that range. I'm guessing is where it's going to shake out at the end of this year. Mm-hmm. And so far, I think. Uh, the, the deals we've closed this year, it's going to be about average profit of about 22000 per deal. So mm-hmm. the numbers work. I mean, the return on investment is there. If we're paying you know, 3000 to get a deal and we're making 22000 it you know, makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Do you find do you find that there's different parts of the country that do better? You mentioned you know, mar- some markets may be better than others. I imagine probably Midwest markets may be a little bit better, would you say? I've never really done anything in the Midwest. No. I've never even, you know, I've thought about some of the areas, but we just haven't. Most of our stuff is on the East Coast at this point, you know, like the whole all the the East Coast states pretty much. Uh not not the Northeast, but pretty much, you know, Pennsylvania down. So that's, that's kind of our, where our sweet spot is, but I've also done stuff in the Pacific Northwest and in California too. But, um, you know, it seems like everyone kind of, a lot of the investors I know, they kind of fall into a little groove of like areas, which they really kind of understand. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity. There's, there's so many properties in those areas. You'd really have to be sending out massive amounts of mail in order to kind of, you know, burn everything up, I guess, burn all those leads up. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of opportunity. And and I know a lot of people that do Midwest or Texas. I know a lot of people that do the desert, you know, like desert squares, they call them. They're buying, you know, five, 10 acre parcels in the desert, a completely different business model. They may buy these things for, you know, hundred dollars an acre, and then they sell them on owner financing and just take payments for, for a long time. And you know, their return on investment is great. It's just kind of hard to make the bigger numbers that way, in my opinion. Yeah. I was just going to say that I was talking to one of our land clients and, and, uh, that model where, you know, you buy a piece of land for 5,000, you mark it up for thir- to 30, you collect a $5,000 down payment, and then you're nothing into the deal and you just collect the payments in the, in the interest. Right. And, and, uh, but you're right. That's not super, super scalable. Um, but you know, that could work for some people and maybe get them mm-hmm. in the game and get them started. So, yep, for sure. Yeah. So tell us about uh, the best deal you've ever done. Oh, the best deal. I would say, I would say that bigger one, the 315,000 sold it for 595. Mm-hmm. That was kind of my favorite. It was an awesome property, 650 acres, <laughs> something like that. And uh beautiful property, you know, pine trees all over it. And it was, it was just a situation where it was an inherited property and, you know, they lived in a different cellar, lived in a different state and they just kind of wanted to move on. They had tried to market it. They had tried to market it uh, a couple of times in the past, you know, they overpriced it and it sat on the market for a long time and they didn't sell it. So they were just interested in moving on. And that's why th- they took our offer. I think it originally offered them 295 and then we negotiated up to 315, but it took about somewhere, I think it took about five months to close, five months from beginning to end, which was long longer than than my normal deal because of the follow ups um, or because of the closing process partially the closing process i think it was a 45 day escrow but the the main thing is we had started higher you know we had started at 750 or something like that and then we kind of gradually kept working it down but um, oh, you mean you when you priced it? I see. Yeah, our list price when we. Put oh, it I see. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. And what what did they originally list it at when they had it on the I market? I think they were you know eight ninety nine maybe okay. something like that. And you know, and as soon as I bought it, I got a call from the neighbor who had previously leased out the property for hunting and everything. It's like, oh, they've been trying to sell this stuff, this property for years. You're never going to sell it. And I was like, okay, a little bit concerned. I know. I hate, I hate those but calls. I, just... <laughs> I hate when I talk to a neighbor and they're like, you're never going to. And then I, you know, you sell just fine. Yeah, yeah that's right. I know. <laughs> you know, and, and who knows what, you know, his motivation, he wanted to lease the property again. I'm like, oh no, we're selling it. So 
Um, but we did some stuff to that. We actually, we cleared some paths on the property, which made it a lot more marketable and accessible. Mm -hmm. So I think that was, that was kind of a minor thing that we did, but it made a huge difference. So, yeah. Yeah. Tell us about the, on the other side, tell us about the worst deal you've ever done. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd say my worst deal was one that was just, uh, just really kind of frustrating. I thought it was the greatest deal ever when I got it. And it was, this is like, I don't know, maybe in the first 10 deals that I did or something like that. I bought, it was a 13 acre property and it was in like the Southeast. And it was in the middle of one of these, uh, a city actually, but it was kind of like in between two subdivisions, kind of a junk piece of property really. Mm -hmm. But when the, when the seller, you know, contacted us, they're like, okay, we'll, we'll accept your offer, which I think the offer was, I don't know, 15 to 20,000. Then I looked at the property. I'm like, yeah, I can't do that. It's like landlocked and there's like partially wetlands. And I'm like, eh. I, you know, I, I really don't want this property, but I'm going to offer him like such a low, low amount for it that, you know, he's probably just going to say, you know, screw you. And, 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 and I, we'd both be on our way, but I think I offered 3000 and then he's like, okay, he accepted it. And I was like, oh, okay, what am I going to do? Is I'm, I'm going to be able to sell this landlocked property. What ended up happening? I actually made money on it. So it's, I can't say that it's like a terrible deal by any means. I think I sold it for you know, five or six grand or something like that. But right. it was just such a hassle, you know, so many buyers calling about it. why is this so cheap? You know, all this stuff. And I ended up selling it, but it was just, I was just so happy to see it go because I was making hardly anything on it. And it was just kind of a thorn in my side, fell out of escrow a couple of times just because I don't know if the people didn't realize it wasn't landlocked, even though I was very clear about all that stuff, you know? So it's just, it, it taught me a good lesson though. To, to not kind of worry about those junky properties. Like I always want to buy decent properties, like good properties where there's access, no landlocked properties anymore. I'm not buying any properties that are hundred percent swamp or anything like that. So it taught me a lesson. Cheap isn't always cheap in the, in the end, I guess. And, and use your gut feeling right too. You know, right. I've, I've got one of those deals right now. I, I lent money so I, I was doing gap funding for a while. I lent money to uh, to this lady, sweet, sweet lady, but I, I knew there was something off, uh, but I funded the deal anyway. And long story short, she ended up taking $80,000 worth of draws from the hard money lender without doing the work. She was taking pictures of like corners of the property or corners of each room, acting like the whole room and everything was done when it was just parts of the property. And uh, we just finally... Got, we got it back and we renovated it. And of course the markets changed. We We funded this like a year and a couple months ago. It's been, I mean, wow. it's when the market was hot. And now we thought, I think at the time we were looking at like 500 or 550 is what we thought we could get for it. And we just listed it for 460. So yeah. you can imagine the numbers on it. So I would take your deal over my deal <laughs> all day long. So <laughs> it's all about perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it was just, I uh, just, it was such a thorn in my side that it probably, you know, and, and it probably just held me back from doing other deals because of the time I was spending on this thing. Yeah. But so uh, tell me about um, what's next for you. So you, it seems like you're kind of mastered in a short period of time, by the way, the land thing, what's next for you? Do you have some big goals? Do you have some things that yeah, you're working yeah, I've on? Got some, I've got some things that I'm, I'm doing kind of related to that. Well, first of all, my goal for, for 2023 is to scale this up to uh, 10 million, 10 million in revenue. And I think I could do it. Pretty sure I can do it. Time will tell. So that's my kind of uh, immediate goal for the next for the next full year. As well as far as long term, I've I'm really interested in kind of the renewable energy space and uh, working on developing some of these larger properties into solar farms. Hmm. So there's a lot of federal incentives for tax reasons, and there's just a lot of money going into into that industry in general. And I think doing what we're doing with the land, we run into a lot of parcels, which would be pretty ideal for a solar farm. You know, the ideal property for a solar farm is one where you've got those huge transmission lines like running right through the property. And those are junk properties that no one wants. Mm -hmm. So if we could take some of those, pick them up for the right price and kind of chip away at them, and develop, in, don't develop them into a solar farm, which is a long process. You know, it's a two to five year deal. And then either, you know, build the projects out ourselves, or get it all approved and sell it to someone else that's going to build it out. But regardless in any of those scenarios, we, we would definitely be winning. They're trying to convert the entire grid um, to renewable energy by 2035. So that just means like a ton of money's 
moving in that direction and it's it's going there it's just a matter of who's going to get a piece of it yeah i've seen some of those out here in california i started flying about a year ago and every once in a while I'll just get blinded by this light you know oh, yeah. you know glaring off of these panels and figured out that they were solar farms so mm -hmm. um, that's interesting i'd like to see how that would play out i imagine that would probably take some of the deals you're doing and make them like just unbelievably profitable right if you could make them work oh definitely definitely and you know it's a longer term deal and there's not Honestly, there's just not much out there as far as information training or courses or anything related to that YouTube video. There's just, it's very difficult to get to the information, but there are companies that do solar developments, you know, mm -hmm. they'll, they're engineers for that, those type of projects. So I imagine that's kind of where I'm going to learn how to do it. I'll be calling up these companies and, and hiring them to put it, put the project all together for me. Are there tax credits that they give for that? Do you know? Yeah, it's a 30% uh, federal tax credit. So yeah. when you, when you, anything you spend on, on the project. So and then you get, and then, be. and then you get a, I imagine bonus depreciation probably applies to that too, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm told. So the government's trying to push everyone in that direction. So, you know, like rich dad, poor dad says, you know, as far as like, that's what the tax code is all about. You know, it's, it's, they're trying to incentivize you to do certain things. And as real estate investors, that's, you know, taxes are, are, are a great reason to um, move in certain directions. So mm -hmm. try and take those cues because it's like one of those things where obviously it's obvious to me that that market in the future is is going to be a lot more valuable than it is right now. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. Awesome. Good stuff. Good stuff. Pete, anything else that uh, you want to share with our audience before we start wrapping uh, yeah, up? Yeah, um, we're doing, if anyone is interested in kind of following, you know, our progress as a business, a land flipping business, I'm posting um, regular or monthly income reports showing our monthly revenue, our deal by deal breakdown. Like we bought this property for 20,000. We sold it for 43,000 held it for this many days and, and kind of a little write up on each property and each deal we do each month, profit margins, everything like that. You can go check that out, turningprofit.com. We're also got a, a new podcast that, that started up about that as well, you know, real estate investing. So with my wife as a co-host and that's about it. Cool. Good stuff, man. Well, appreciate the time. Um, I, you know, I'm definitely motivated to to look more into land. I feel like that could be a really good profit center for for real estate investors that are already doing deals. And I'm excited, you know, looking into that mainly to not have to deal with contractors, not to have to deal with tenants and and things of that nature. So I don't know if it'll go anywhere, but I definitely will get my team to to look into it and see if it's a, a venture that we want to get into. So thanks for sharing your knowledge and congrats on um, you know the success in a short amount of time. It's been what year year and a half ago that you really started um, you know doing yeah that, yeah doing March of uh, 2021 is when we did our first completed our first flip. So yeah, yeah. going to be two years here pretty soon. No, that's good. That's amazing. I mean, to be able to do that many deals, 80 deals in a year, I mean, for real estate investing, that's, that's pretty hard uh, pretty hard to do in the single family space. So that's super exciting. So, well, thanks again, Pete. We appreciate your time and we'll have to grab uh, grab lunch here in San Diego. Sounds like a plan. All right, appreciate cool, it, Tony. All right, we'll talk yep. soon. Thanks, buddy. All right, thanks. Thanks.